I'd like to thank Get Around and Open Up Summit uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak about uh, a topic I'm very passionate about, which is creativity. And I want to give a special shout out to Jane for inviting me. So today I'm going to help you understand three things. Number one, why creativity is the number one soft skill of 2019. Then I'm going to go into two, why I know that you, every single person in this room is creative. And three, last but not least, the five steps for hacking creativity. And then we're going to go into question and response. And the reason why I don't call it question and answer is because when you say question and answer, it often implies that there's only one right answer. But there's many great responses, which helps fuel creativity. So I call it question and response. And I'm going to make this conversation uh, or this talk more like a conversation. So I'm going to be often asking you for your input, OK? So please pay attention. A little bit about me. I have a strong, diverse, creative background, uh, along with being Get Around's talent, brand, and diversity lead. I'm also a drummer, filmmaker, comedian, and poet. And while at UC Berkeley, I wrote and produced a sitcom and two short films. I also co-developed and co-taught a 12-week course on creative thinking. And it's from that course and from research and from my personal experiences, I'm going to share with you how you can generate creative ideas on a regular basis. I often get asked, what's the relationship between creativity and innovation? Well, I'm a visual learner, so I learn through analogies and metaphors. And using an analogy, their relationship is like constructing a building. Creativity is the architectural blueprint, right? The drawing of the building. And innovation is the actual construction of that building, the implementation of the idea. So creativity is the first step or the foundation of innovation. And what is one of Get Around's core values, as well as many tech companies? What's a very popular uh, core value of companies? You want to shout out an idea? What's a core value? Innovation. innovation, thank you, exactly. So both creativity and innovation are what gives us a competitive edge in the tech industry. And with the rise of AI and robots, they're great at optimizing existing ideas, but we companies need creative employees to come up with tomorrow's solutions. That's why LinkedIn crowned creativity as the number one soft skill for professionals after they analyze hundreds of thousands of job postings to see what companies need most this year in terms of skills. And in LinkedIn's 2018 workforce learning report, 57% of senior leaders say that soft skills are actually more important than hard skills, precisely because they're the skills that robots can't automate. So examples of soft skills include empathy, creativity, and collaboration. The bottom line is that creativity is vital to both your career and your company, and it will only become increasingly so. Now you might be thinking, crap, I'm not creative. How many of you think that you might not be creative? Thank you for being honest. Well, I have good news for you that everyone is creative, and I'm going to give you proof to debunk that self-limiting belief. In Sir Ken Robinson's TED Talk, Changing Educational Paradigms, he cited research on 1,500 kindergartners on divergent thinking. Now you might be thinking, what is divergent thinking? Well, it's an essential capacity for creativity. If I was going to test you right now on your divergent thinking, I would ask you, how many uses can you think of for a paperclip? So the protocol of the test is that if you scored above a certain level, you're considered a genius at divergent thinking. So out of these 1,500 kindergartners, what percentage do you believe scored at genius level at divergent thinking? Go ahead, shout out numbers. How many, what percentage of these 1,500 random kindergartners 
that were tested in divergent thinking, how many of them scored at genius level? Very, very close. It's actually 98%. So it was a longitudinal study. They tested the same kids five years later when they were eight to 10 years old. What percentage do you believe scored at genius level then when they were eight to 10 years old, five years later? 60%? W any other numbers? 40, 20, okay, you're, you're, you're all around the right number. It's actually 32% scored at genius level at divergent thinking. So they retested the, five, uh, the same kids five years later when they were 13 to 15 years old. How many do you believe scored at genius level at divergent thinking then when they were 13 to 15 years old? Same kids. 10%, I actually, you said 10, good job, yeah. I mean, that's bad news, but it's 10% that scored at genius level at divergent thinking. So this is strange, right? With most skills, you get better as you get older, but it shows us that we actually are trained in school to think that there's only one right answer and it's at the back of the book, right? And that's why I don't believe in question and answer. But the good news is that we can learn how to tap back into our creativity because we all have it. At least 98% of all of us have it. I don't think you're the part of the 2%, so I think you're all creative. So how do we regularly tap back into our creative capacity as adults? Here are five practical steps for you to hack your creativity that is inside of you. As I mentioned, I love analogies and metaphors. So I came up with a metaphor on how we can harvest our ideas. But instead of harv harvesting veggies and fruits like the last talk was talking about, we're talking about farming for ideas. The first step for hacking to creativity is sowing seeds of experiences. What do I mean by that? In 2014, I did an experiment I made a New Year's resolution to try one thing, one new experience I've never had before once a month. So in January, I learned how to snowmobile. In February, I learned how to ride a motorcycle. In March, I learned how to glass blow. In April, I learned how to fly a plane. Why does this step work? Well, there's three reasons why this step works. Number one, it teaches you to have a learner mentality that you're always a student willing to learn. LinkedIn's 2018 talent research found that learnability is one of the most in-demand skills. Knowing the answer is less critical than the ability to ask the right questions in the first place. So this skill teaches you learnability, how to be open and always willing to learn. The second reason why this step works is that new experiences inspire new ideas. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple said, innovation is the result of connecting past experiences. But if you have the same experiences as everyone else, you're unlikely to look in a new direction and think differently. Basically, this is what it means. When being creative, we're really connect connecting the dots of experiences to form new ideas. So the more experiences you have are the more dots you have and the more ideas that will come. The third reason why this step works is that it gets us used to taking risks and stepping out of the familiar. I remember in 2014 when I was trying to convince myself to get on a snowmobile for the first time, it took me two hours to not like to actually get on the snowmobile. I was so scared because it was a new experience. What if I fail, right? But now I'm constantly looking for new opportunities. Why is that? Why am I now excited? Like if you ask me right now to go jet ski, I've never jet skied before, but now I would jump on the opportunity. This is why. It teaches you to get comfortable with risk and failure. Risk and failure are a necessary part of the creative process. You don't get anywhere new without stepping out of the familiar. IDEO, the world famous design firm's mantra is fail early and fail often. 
So I want to ask you right now, if you can respond to me, what new experiences are you planning to have? Go ahead and shout out some ideas of new experiences that you would like to try. Learn a new language. I'm going to take two more responses. What other new experience would you be willing to try? Huh? Diving? Ah, diving. OK, that's good. Anybody else? Watching Netflix. You never watched Netflix before? Watch a new show on Netflix? OK, I like it. Yes, watch a new show on Netflix. That's a new experience. That's true. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So as you get out and have these new experiences, you get out, you get exposed, ideas will come to you. So now, what do you do with those ideas that start coming to you as you have these new experiences? You need to learn how to cultivate them, which leads me to the second step for hacking creativity. Cultivate. We cultivate ideas by capturing them. Ideas come when we're showering, walking, driving, and even dreaming. Why? Because these activities release dopamine in your brain, which according to renowned neurologist Alice Flaherty triggers the creative part of your brain. So the next time you get stuck, and you're trying to come up with a new idea, I would encourage you to try walking, driving, showering, uh, even sleeping. I'll tell you that actually this step works. I was trying to think of a new way to present this talk to you today, and last night I was dreaming about this talk, and I thought, let's make it more interactive. So an idea came to me in my sleep last night. So trust me in that when you do this, these activities, ideas will come because it releases dopamine in your brain. But they often come at inconvenient times, right? If you're showering or driving or walking. But if creative ideas are a precious commodity, then we need to learn to capture them. Tell it to Siri. Take a photo or video of the idea. Jot it down. What do you have on you right now that you can jot down your ideas in? You can record your ideas. Hold it up. What do you have? Everybody has a phone on them, right? So use that. We bring our phones everywhere. So record your idea when it happens. I actually created an idea file in my notes app on my iPhone. And I record all my ideas in there. And at the end of the week, I'll review them. So what do you do with those ideas? That takes me to step three. You need to germinate them. You need to develop your ideas. Step three of hacking creativity. At the end of the week or at the end of the month, review your idea file that you've been collecting on your phone. Develop one or a few that excite you. Don't be critical. Bad ideas are often stepping stones to good ones. How many of you know Pixar? You know Inside Out, Toy Story, Finding Nemo, right? Well, Ed Catmull, the president of Pixar, said that all their films started as ugly babies and developed into something beautiful. Yeah, that's talking about all those movies, like Monsters, Inc. They started as ugly ideas, but they became something beautiful because they, they developed them. So when's a time during the month you can develop an idea on a regular basis? What's a time in your week that you have a half an hour window? You can shout out ideas. Sunday. Sunday. Yeah? Anybody else? Saturday? Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, there you go. So set aside a half an hour on your calendar, on your schedule, once a month. So now that you've developed an idea, what's next? That's the first step of hacking creativity is to prune your idea. What do I mean by prune your idea? Get feedback from two or three people. Our team emails our ideas back and forth to each other for feedback. We also crowdsource ideas uh, in our team meetings. Why does this step work to prune your ideas? Because two heads are better than one head. Brain tr uh, we talked about Pixar. Pixar has these groups called brain trusts. Brain trusts are a gathering of two or three people 
that share feedback with one another on their creative projects, okay? And there's four requirements of these brain trusts of two or three people. Number one, they all have to be in the creative process themselves. Number two, they need to be safe and trustworthy. Number three, the group needs to keep everything confidential so you know that your ideas are safe, right? And last but not least, number four, you don't have to follow their suggestions. It protects the relational dynamic for everyone to speak freely. If you tell me, hey, you need to change that character's name, I don't have to listen. I get to decide as the creator what to do with your feedback, but I don't have to do your feedback. And that helps protect everyone in the relationship. So who do you have in your life that can be part of your brain trust? Can you think of a couple people? Does anybody want to share a name of somebody that they can immediately think of who might be a good person who fits all these categories? Anybody? Oh, I see someone pointing to someone else. I like it. Good. You're right next to each other. Wonderful. So think about it and write down the people you want to ask. I have my friend David. He's in my brain trust and my friend Charlotte. They are in my brain trust and we share ideas regularly over text and email. So now what do you do with that pruned idea? That takes us to our fifth and final step. You need to harvest your idea. What do I mean by harvest? Publish it on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. I consider these platforms a creative's best friend. Why? Because most people will push like on your idea and positive feedback fuels more creativity. Many great ideas are lost because they never see the light of day. So put yourself out there and it will fuel your creative process. Where will you publish your ideas? I want to hear from you. Maybe two people, share, share with me where you think is a good platform for you to share your ideas. Yeah? What? Medium. Medium. Great suggestion. I didn't even think about that. See, that's why we need to get each other's ideas, input. Uh, anybody else? What? GitHub. GitHub, yes. Exactly. Perfect. See, you, you're coming up with these great ideas that I didn't think of, and that's why we need to share our ideas with one another. We need to have an open up summit. So. These are the five steps for hacking creativity from farm to light laptop. And here's a real life example of how I implemented these steps from start to finish in less than a week to put meat on the bones for what I'm saying, to give you an example of how I use these steps to come up with a creative idea, okay? So number one, have a new experience, right? I spontaneously got asked by my friend David to go watch a play called Everybody at Shakespeare Theater in San Francisco. That's where I'm from, I'm from San Francisco. I've never been to the Shakespeare Theater, so, and I never heard of the play, Everybody, so that's a new experience, and I got inspired, so that's step one, new experience, new play, new theater. Number two, capture your ideas. That night, I went home and journaled my ideas inspired by the play. I'm gonna tell you what the play is about. It's my favorite play. So, there's a character named Everybody, and there is a character named Death. And Death comes to the character named Everybody. Everybody represents all of humankind. And says, hey, it's your time to go to death. And Everybody says, no, I don't wanna go to death. And Death says, too bad, I'm, I'm gonna take you to death. And Everybody said, wait, can I at least ask somebody to come with me to death? And, ev and death said to everybody, if you can convince somebody to come with you to death, then I will let them come with you. So he gave him a day to try to convince somebody to go with him to death. So the character named everybody goes to the character named family and says, family, will you come with me to death? And family says, no, we're blood, but blood ends at death. Then he goes to a character named Friendship and says, Friendship, will you come with me to death? And Friendship says, no, you know, I'm with you till the end, and this is the end. Finally, yeah, it's funny. So uh, 
everybody goes to a character named belongings, possessions, right? And says, will you come with me to death? And belongings said, nope, you can't take me with you. So finally, everybody's crying, so upset, like nobody will come with me to death. And finally, a mystery character comes to everybody and says, I will go with you to death. Now, I'm not going to give away yet who that mystery character is. But I jotted all these ideas down based on the play that night. I captured my ideas. Step three, I developed my ideas. Two nights later, on a Monday evening, I set aside an hour to develop my ideas into a poem. Step four, get feedback. I, I emailed the poem to my brain trust, David, Charlotte, and my friend Madeline, and asked them for their feedback. I incorporated their feedback that made sense to me, right? Again, remember, brain trust, you, they can't mandate their feedback. You don't have to take their feedback. You can listen and not use it. Fifth step, publish your ideas. I published my poem on Instagram five days later after watching the play, and I sent it to the Shakespeare Theater in San Francisco as a thank you for doing such a wonderful job with the play. And they loved it, and they posted it on their Instagram as well. Do you want to hear the poem? Yeah. All right, cool. All right. I'm glad you didn't say no, because then I would still read it. Um, OK, so here's the poem. And while I read the poem, think about if you can figure out who is the mystery character that did go with everybody to death. All right. Here's the poem. Let that be enough. On the eve of the garden, cusp between our hands, sun rays like sticky saccharin danced upon our nakedness and clung to our bodies like honey's nectar, so concentrated on filling the vacant within us, the cavity that never existed, until we tasted of its fruit and the rotting began. Fissures decaying us from within, malnourished by sickening sweet little lies whispered, layer by layer, eating away at the enamel of life, a delectable fantasy that's all sugar and no spice. When our roots were designed for canals of flesh, dug by our own bare hands, a hollow grave where we bury all the illusions that we owned any heart or possessed any object when all we will ever truly have is love. Thank you. You can clap. Wow. Thanks. <laughs>